So t- today's message, evil errors. Um, I'll get that in a minute. The scripture I'm going to read is from Matthew chapter 28. The victory is won. Uh, a couple days ago, I was part of the, the ministeriums, the New Cumberland Church's Good Friday service. And for me, Good Friday truly is painful. I really don't like to be a part of that service because, uh, you know, they did this time where they just asked people, what does Good Friday mean to you? Or what does the cross mean to you? And they went around, people just would stand up and say a word. And the words were always all like very positive and encouraging. I'm like, for me, it's not at all. When I think of Jesus on the cross, like it hurts. It, it hurts. And I can't wait to get through that day. I love, you know, we have Holy Thursday here. It was much like the brunch, like food everywhere and people you know, socializing, having fun. And, you know, we get to serve and we have feet washing and we had a baptism. A great, great evening, just like Jesus with his disciples. Um, I just soon fast forward to today, you know, the resurrection, which is the good news of Jesus Christ. So, I don't know if you've ever noticed um, that evil behavior tends to be reckless and self-centered. Like, even as you think of your own life, situations that you may go through, uh, like road rage, you're out on the road, right, and somebody's tailgating you, so maybe you tap the brakes, or, you know, my friend told me one time, somebody's tailgating you, go off the road a little bit, kick some rocks up, that'll back, get them to back off, and it works, I know from personal experience, but we, when evil is attacking us, we have this bad thing, you know, people die over minor road incidents. Uh, in New Cumberland, just a couple weeks ago, there was a murder-suicide, and from what I understand, like this this guy loved this girl and couldn't be with her, so he went and killed her and then killed himself and almost killed her husband. Like, that is what evil does. When evil comes and attacks us, not that people are evil, Satan is evil, and he wants us to act upon his will. And today we're going to look at something. I, uh, the beginning of this message, I think, will interest the men probably more than the women in general, and that might be a sexist statement, but I'm going to stand by it. Uh, so, so I was talking to Troy, and he's like, you know, what are you going to talk about today? I was, I'm going to talk about two of my favorite subjects, the resurrection of Jesus and World War II. <laughs> so, uh, and many of you know, I, I have a pretty good connection to World War II. I wasn't in it, but my dad was in it, and I'm named after my uncle who died uh, in Australia during World War II, and I had some other uncles serve. Um, so I have a pretty good connection to the war, even though I was never in the military. So... The Japanese attacked Pearl Harbor on Sunday, December 7th, 1941. Now, we weren't at war yet, and Japan attacked us, and we were unaware of it. Do you know why Japan attacked Pearl Harbor? If you were, now, some of you I talked to about this, and if you were at the earlier service, you know. The primary reason Japan attacked the United States at Pearl Harbor was over oil, which is ironic, because why, did Rush, why is Russia going into the Ukraine? You know, things don't change much. You know, here we are, we're still fighting wars over oil and energy. Uh, So when when the United States was attacked by Japan, I believe that Satan was behind these attacks, that he was leading the Japanese people, the the leadership of Japan, to cause this war, to get the United States into the war. And Japan thought that they could cripple us so much at Pearl Harbor that there wouldn't even be a war. We would just surrender. But they made some mistakes as evil tends to do. When you're acting on behalf of evil, you often have blinders on and you don't see things that really matter a lot. So I'm gonna go through these pretty quickly. Some of the mistakes they made. Uh, They attacked on a Sunday. Why Why was that important? It was important because according to General Nimitz, who was put in charge of the Pacific Fleet, 90% of the sailors were off on leave. They weren't at Pearl Harbor. They were off. Some of them were probably in church. Other ones were out among the island of Oahu or maybe even somewhere else. General Nimitz estimated that if they would have attacked on a different day, any other day, the death toll would have been approaching 30,000 Americans. Mistake on Japan's attack. Another thing that they did is they didn't attack the dry docks across from the harbor. Now, I wasn't in the Navy, uh, so I'm not real familiar with dry docks. A few of you are, probably. Uh, So when Japan was attacking Pearl Harbor, they saw our battleships lined up in a row, and they had such lust for destruction and hatred that they went all in and attacked those ships. Well, right across the harbor were the dry docks. What the dry docks are used for is fixing boats that are damaged. 
If they would have attacked the dry docks, which would have been very easy to do because it was right there, instead of those boats being drug across Pearl Harbor and fixed, they would have had to have been towed back to the continental United States like 3,000 miles away. Our ships were fixed and back in duty in a faster time than it would have took to get them just back to the United States. A mistake, they should have hit the dry docks. Another thing they didn't do was they didn't attack our submarines that were based in Pearl Harbor. I'm, and I'm think, I think about that, I'm like, how could you not? Like, submarines are very vulnerable when you can see them. And as the war went on, 90% of the ships, Japanese ships that were sunk during World War II were sunk by our submarines. Mistake. They didn't destroy, they did not destroy our ground top fuel storage tanks. So General Nimitz said, right over the hill, five miles away, were our storage tanks, where all the fuel was. He said, every drop of fuel for the Pacific Fleet was stored there. They didn't send one plane, which could have wiped them out. You've seen these storage tanks, right? Just drop a missile into one, boom, they're done. Now, some people believe that Japan thought they would invade Hawaii and they would take that fuel, which is why they didn't hit that. I'm not sure about that, but somebody said that to me. Uh, easy target, sitting tar it's a sitting duck, and you don't attack it, you don't take out our fuel. It would have crippled us. And the last one that I'm going to mention is, they attacked when our aircraft carriers weren't at Pearl Harbor, but were out at sea. And if you know much about World War II, whoever has the aircraft carriers is going to win the war. And as you follow the Battle of the Midway and such, everybody was looking for each other's aircraft carriers because that's how you were able to attack and that's how you won wars, that's how you sunk ships. And our aircraft carriers weren't there. They were out at sea doing exercises. So none of our aircraft carriers were sunk at Pearl Harbor. These are all tactical errors that they made. And Japan, in their desperation, made critical mistakes. Satan, in his desperation, also made some critical mistakes. And that's where I'm drawing this connection. Because attacking an innocent people is pure evil. And Satan is behind all pure evil. So... Think about this. God creates mankind in his own image. The Bible tells us in God's image, we as people are made. We are his treasured creation. And then God places man in a garden paradise. Like It was perfect. No gnats, no mosquitoes, no ticks, no you know, whatever bugs you when you're outside. Like it was perfect. It was a paradise. And God said, you can have everything in the garden, except don't eat from the one tree, the tree of the fruit of the knowledge of good and evil. And the key there is the knowledge of evil. Adam and Eve didn't deal with evil until they ate the fruit from that one tree. They wanted, Satan convinced them, that they should have, that it was good, the knowledge of evil. We all have the knowledge of evil, right? And it's horrible. I just, you know, my dad, we just buried him in February. You know, God didn't plan death, suffering, pain. These are all a result of what Satan has done. Satan lied to Adam and Eve and led mankind into sin. Man became separated from God. You have a holy God and sin, and they just cannot coexist together. Satan thought he won the war. And you've got to think about it. Satan, when he attacked man in the garden, man, he was really successful. Japan thought they were really successful when they attacked Pearl Harbor. When they were leaving for home, they probably thought, yeah, you know, this was an incredible win for us. And they were so blinded. Uh, one more thing about the attack on Pearl Harbor is Japan had considered, uh, they, had do, they had sent two waves of attacks on Pearl Harbor. And I think they originally planned a third wave. And they decided not to do that. That could have been, that could be the difference in us winning and losing the war. Another tactical mistake that they made. Um, I had an uncle, by the way, that was at Pearl Harbor when it was attacked and survived, and he was later killed in Hawaii. Um, I think that was on my, I think on my mom's side. I get it mixed up. Anyway, Satan thought he won the war, and just think about what he did. He took God's treasured creation, mankind, and put a chasm between us and the holy God. That's pretty good. That's a pretty good battle that he won. But, and we can fast forward because we know the New Testament and we kind of know how this story plays out. God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. 
However, Satan sees God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son. So when Jesus left heaven and came to earth, Satan saw that. Now here you have the Son of God, the Messiah, walking around pretty much as vulnerable as you and I are, living in the flesh. He could be killed. And Satan, in his hatred and his lust for destruction and his hatred of God and his despising of people, and now Jesus is walking around as a person, he goes all in in killing and trying to kill Jesus. And this is when Satan made his critical mistake. He should have left Jesus alone. But God had a plan, and God knew the desires, the lust in Satan's heart to destroy his son. And his plan worked pretty well. Because what we call Good Friday was when the Son of God was betrayed, spat upon, cursed, beaten, abused, and nailed to a cross where he died. Now, Satan was probably celebrating. This was probably a moment that he's like, yeah. He probably had complete joy. No, well, not joy. He probably had complete satisfaction in this moment. But what he didn't know is this was going to lead to his destructions. Much like, much like Japan's attack on the United States, uh, I think it was the emperor of Japan said, I'm afraid that we have awoken a sleeping bear. Or something, not exact quote, going from memory. Yeah, you know what? Japan as a nation had never been attacked at home until a little bit after they attacked the United States when I think it was 18 months or 16 months, we sent a, a bunch of bombers over and we bombed Japan in their homeland. It was the first time they had ever been attacked at home. As far as I know. Now my history, yeah, yeah. So maybe, you know, probably as bad as my English. But anyway, Satan now is satisfied. And remember Jesus' words on the cross? He says, it is finished. Satan was probably thinking the same thing. It is finished. I killed the Son of God. It was Friday, but Sunday was coming. Anyway, it's still Friday, and Jesus is buried in the tomb. He's dead. Satan is probably partying, you know, through this big, you know, everybody's getting drunk and an orgy and all this, you know, evil desire thing that Satan throws at people and his demons are probably going crazy and partying and, ah. But, let's fast forward to Sunday. After the Sabbath, at dawn on the first day of the week, which would be Sunday, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary went to look at the tomb. There was a violent earthquake For an angel of the Lord came down from heaven and going to the tomb, rolled back the stone and sat on it. His appearance was like lightning and his clothes were white as snow. The guards were so afraid of him that they shook and became like dead men. The angel said to the women, do not be afraid for I know that you are looking for Jesus who was crucified. He is not here. He has risen, just as he said. Come and see the place where he lay. Then go quickly and tell his disciples, He has risen from the dead and is going ahead of you into Galilee. There you will see him. Now I have told you. Jesus has risen. And this is where Satan's plan leads to Satan's destruction. Jesus has risen from the dead. What Satan didn't realize, or maybe he even did realize it and had such hatred for the Son of God, that he allowed Jesus to die and be raised from the dead. And in that, he allowed sinful people, who he caused to be separated from God, because we are sinful, to be reconciled to a holy God. Jesus, in essence, took the sin that I have committed and the sins that you have committed with him to the cross where your sins died. Jesus took the penalty of your sin and my sin. That should have been me hanging on the cross, which is probably why I hate thinking about Jesus on the cross, as most of you know, I can't stand getting a needle, let alone nails. My goodness, the pain, the suffering that he went through, but it all comes out, and he is raised from the dead, and all things are satisfied. And we think of what John wrote. He said, God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. Eternal life. 
Jesus was speaking to Martha, and he said, I am the resurrection and the life. Whoever believes in me will live, even though they die. And whoever lives by believing in me will never die. Do you believe this? Now, Jesus was asking Martha that. Uh, I often use this passage at end-of-life services, usually at, at the graveside when we're among the dead, all the, the tombstones and people that are buried. Um, not necessarily everyone, but usually. And this is something we need to think about. Do we believe in the resurrection of Jesus Christ or not? And this thought of belief is so important. And you hear me talk about it a lot if you're a regular here. Satan believes that Jesus is the Son of God. That's not going to get you to heaven. Satan believes that Jesus died on the cross. That's not going to get you to heaven. Satan believes that Jesus was raised from the dead. Obviously, intellectual belief isn't enough. Action has to follow it. Belief is an action word in the Scripture. We see it repeatedly throughout the Bible. Jesus says, if you love me, and I know probably most of you could repeat the next section, you will obey my teachings or my commands. So your obedience to Jesus is an indication of your love and belief for Jesus. So it's Resurrection Sunday. We're celebrating the resurrection of Jesus Christ because he opened the gate to heaven and all who believe with a commitment, a surrender, will inherit eternal life with Jesus. Like that is the criteria. That is the bar that God, that God has set. If you believe in the Son of God, he will welcome you into his kingdom. What about you? Like, what are you committing your life to? Are you, uh, if you think, and you all know the answer to this for yourself, have I committed my life to Jesus Christ? I know I said I did. Like, if you want to bow your head and say a prayer with me, and then I'll ask you to raise your hand. Like, have you given your life to Jesus? You know, your hand will go up, maybe. That's not what is required for eternal salvation. It is the commitment to, to that process, to the belief, to the prayer Jesus, I give you my life, and I mean that. So I used to work for AMP, AMP Incorporated. They were one of the largest electronic companies in the world, a Fortune 500 company. And the department I was in, we had won an award the one time. They sent us to this, you know, the corporate headquarters or whatever, and there's a big award ceremony. The CEO and all the executives are there, and they bring in this speech, like national speaker from California, and he said something, this was probably 30 years ago now, he said something I have not forgotten, and I've repeated it over time. He said, if I want to know what's important to you, I'm going to look at two things. I'm going to look at your calendar and your checkbook. Where do you spend your time, and where do you spend your money? Because that will tell me what's important to you. Think about that, especially your calendar. You know, where, where do you spend your time? You know, if you're, you know, we all do different things. Like, you know, Dalton and Logan were asked me if I'd get out fishing much. Like, no, I don't. I really don't care for fishing. Uh, but if you spend all your time fishing and it's becoming about you and catching the biggest fish, maybe you're putting fishing ahead of God. And I'm, I'm not saying you guys are. Just Larry knows not to sit in front of me because I'll talk about whoever's there. Uh, <laughs> but fishing is just one example. Like, what are you fully devoted to in your life? Because that might be your God. And I hope that it is the Son of God. You know, I mean, you have to live a life, you have to earn a living, you have to do a lot of things in life, but you will take Jesus with you. You know, we just came out of a series of presence-based living. You know, when you leave this building today, you don't leave Jesus here when you leave. He's like, see you next week. No. He's like, where are we going? Or better yet, you should be saying to Jesus, where are we going? And that's what we should do. You know, Jesus was hung on a cross. We don't, you know, and he told us, pick up your cross and follow me. We don't have to pick up the cross of Jesus. Somebody did that back in the day. We're not called. I doubt if any of us here will die being crucified, being hung on a cross. And that's not what he's asking of us. That's what was asked of him. But he may ask you to pick up a different cross. It might be singing in the choir. That might be what God has called you to. Or it might be, uh, you know, Marilyn was just saying how good, like Betty Lou Yannick, wherever she is, like she's this awesome cook and she loves cooking. And, uh, you know, maybe that's your call. But 
there are many different calls and giftings that God has given us, and what we need to figure out is, what would God have us do? And you could figure it out through prayer, through scripture reading, through the fellowship of other believers, by looking at your passions. You know, your passions can lead you, and it doesn't have to be complicated. You know, I, I gave an example last week and Thursday and this morning about what Rose did, because I, I find it so simplistically effective. Um, Rose Bruce is a woman in our church about my age, uh, and we were having a carnival, an outreach event in our parking lot, and she just simply went across the street and invited a neighbor, a young girl, a 14-year-old, to come and serve at the thing. So the girl comes and she holds snakes, right? People, kids are petting these snakes or whatever people do with snakes. I don't do that stuff, but she's doing this, right? So this girl, she enjoys meeting the other girls there and some of the other people. She starts coming to youth group. She's hearing the teachings of Jesus. She's getting to know people in the church, and she's falling in love with this environment, and she receives Jesus as Savior and Lord of her life, and Thursday, she was baptized. That, it could be that simple. Hey, would you like to come to our carnival and hold snakes? Well, I, I wouldn't necessarily use that exact example, but maybe, would you like to? You know, God hasn't made this too complicated. What he, has, what he has asked you is the same thing he has asked me. Do what I want you to do. It's that simple, right? Ah, I, I wish it would be so simple. But figure out what God wants you to do and then figure out how to do that. Let's pray. Almighty God, what you have asked us to do is not so complicated You were asked to go to the cross so that our sins could be forgiven. And we continue to sin. And you knew we would do that. You had one of your best friends sell you for 30 pieces of silver and have you arrested. You had one of your best friends deny even knowing you three times on the night you were arrested. You had people calling to you on the cross and mocking you and challenging you to come off the cross to prove you are the Son of God. That might have been me, if you are the Son of God. Bring yourself off of that cross. But you were on a mission. You were razor-focused. And you knew what had to happen. And you did it. Your mission was successful. Satan's mission has failed. And Lord, for all here, if there's anybody that doesn't know you as Savior, and Lord, speak into their life. I can give them words, and I can maybe get them to say a prayer. But that is not what you have called us to do. You have called us to make disciples. Lord, if there's anybody here that wants to give their life to you, reach out to them. Send your Holy Spirit. Let them know how simple it is by just saying, Jesus, I receive you as Savior and Lord of my life. And then trying to live like you. That's where it gets a little tricky. Trying to live like you. Lord, give us strength. Give us wisdom and give us encouragement. In Jesus' name. And all of God's people who are in agreement with what I prayed say, Amen. Amen. Remember this, we are called to love each other, not to condemn them. You know, I talked about John 3.16 a couple times. John 3.17 says, Jesus did not come to condemn anyone. He came to save us. And we are to go out into the world, not to condemn or criticize people for anything, because you are a sinner talking and observing other sinners. Love people. That is your job. Go love people in the name of Jesus.